Hello again, and welcome back to History 475. I'm Dr. Ron Trailer, and this is a video lecture number 10. Uh, as you recall, we finished uh, video 9 uh, by talking a little bit about Andrew Jackson as an Indian fighter. Uh, the Battle of Horseshoe Bend between uh, the Tennessee Volunteers, uh, the Creek Indians, um, and uh, Major General of the Tennessee Militia, Andrew Jackson. Now, four days after the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, Napoleon's empire effectively collapses. Now, England is ready, is able to give its undivided attention uh, to uh, the War of 1812, the war uh, happening uh, in the United States. Now, the British had a threefold plan to win that war. Uh, the first part of their plan was to invade the United States uh, from Canada uh, into uh, the state of New York. <laughs> Pardon me. Uh, through uh, the Niagara River and through Lake Champlain. Um, and by doing so, uh, separate uh, New, New York and the states north of New York, in other words, New England, separate them from the United States. Um, part two of the plan was to extend that coastal blockade uh, that was already in place south of New York, but to extend it even further north uh, and make it apply to New England as well. Remember, the original plan was uh, to blockade only south of New York um, and leave New England alone uh, and uh, in the hope that New England would come over to, not jo I, I don't mean they would join England, but they would join England's uh, desire to in the War of 1812. Um, and the third part of the show, so as a result of um, uh, this second part of the plan, the entire eastern seaboard uh, and all the ports in it would be blockaded by the British Navy. And the third part was to seize New Orleans. Now, we have talked about New Orleans in here, and we have said that um, the Mississippi River was extraordinarily important to the American economy uh, because in a time when very few roads existed, uh, travel by water uh, uh, had an importance that we really can't grasp these days. All of the trade that came down the Ohio River, all of the trade that came down the Missouri River, it all went into the Mississippi River, and Missis the Mississippi River then flowed to New Orleans, where all that stuff, whatever that stuff was, all that stuff was then uh, transferred over to ocean-going vessels. Those vessels then went out all over the world. New Orleans was extraordinarily important, um, and uh, according to which year you look at it, uh, New York City and New Orleans uh, they sort of uh, traded back and forth. Who was going to be the largest seaport and who was going to be the second largest seaport? Now, what I said a few moments ago is that uh, four days after the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, which happens in August of 1813, um, I'm sorry, March, in March of 1814, um, uh, the British, uh, Napoleon's empire collapses. Well, that's not really true, as it turns out, because we know, as students of history, that Napoleon is going to make a comeback, um, and he still has one good battle left in him, and that's, of course, the Battle of Waterloo. But as far as right now is concerned, the British think that the war is over. But some people in England um, said, you can't. You can't trust Napoleon. He very well might make a comeback. And if he does, and if we transferred our army to the Western Hemisphere, it's going to make it easier for him to reestablish his European empire. So, England didn't release all of its military 
for use in the War of 1812. Plus, something else was going on in England. <clears throat> the English had been fighting the French uh, for an entire generation. And an entire generation of young men had been lost. Um, so much of England's industrial output had been dedicated to the uh, to the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, there was simply a war weariness in the United States. People were just sick <laughs> of fighting Napoleon and fighting France. Now, the United States was having some success in this war of 1812. The U.S. Navy um, had built some new ships. Remember what we said? It had, the U.S. Navy had gotten down to 16 vessels. Well, we had built some new ships. We had built some really fine. Uh, remember, these were all wooden sailing vessels. But for their time, they were cutting-edge technology. They were, uh, they were fine, fine fighting ships. And those ships had engaged in a number of successful combats against the Royal Navy vessels. So the Navy was really showing that it could hold its own against the Royal Navy. Also, uh, United States Navy vessels and privateers. Now, let's, let's stop right here. Talk about what the heck is a privateer? <clears throat> well, if a nation's navy is not that big, uh, but they still need a powerful navy to defeat an enemy, the option quite often is to create privateers. And a privateer ship is a privately owned vessel. It's not, well, well let's, let's apply this to the United States. A privateer is not a navy vessel, all right? It is a private vessel. That has and the the owners of that vessel have reached an agreement with the United States, um, and the deal is that the ship will be permitted to arm itself, cannon and all that stuff, right? Uh, and that ship will then be able to attack the enemy ships, the ships of our enemies. In this case, England. Now. There's a fine line sometimes between being a privateer and being a pirate. Um, you could have the, the papers uh, that classify you as a privateer, which means that you can only attack British ships in this case. If you, attach your, if you attack a British ship, you're legal. But what happens if you attack a Spanish ship or a Dutch ship or a German ship? Then you're a pirate. So there's a fine line that separates being a pirate from being a privateer. John Lafitte, uh, he walked that balancing line for years and years and years because not, he, he was a privateer. He did have permission from the U.S. government to attack English ships. But from what we can gather, Lafitte also attacked the ships of other nations, which would have made him a pirate. So be aware of the difference. Privateers uh, captured and sunk hundreds of British merchant, merchant ships uh, during that war. And those losses, um, that's expensive uh, because you don't just lose the ship, do you? You lose the cargo, which is probably worth more than the ship. And you it's very likely that you're going to lose uh, the captain and his expertise and the crew and their expertise. So all of this is very difficult to replace. It's very expensive. So British merchants and, Brit and British ship owners um, uh, began to protest to the British government that the government should stop this war and let trade get back to normal. Stop sinking each other's ships. Stop killing each other. Well, remember the threefold plan? But let's talk about the first plan, all right? The first part of it. Uh, and that was an invasion of the United States uh, across the Niagara River. That's where Niagara Falls is. 
um, and Lake Champlain. The main British effort concentrated on attacking into the United States from Lake Champlain, and that effort met a disaster for the British when the, an entire British fleet <laughs> was destroyed in the Battle of Lake Champlain. Uh, that happens in, seven, in September of 1814, and it allows the New York and Vermont militia then to repel a British army that was coming by, by land with the purpose of uh, capturing the New York State Capitol at Albany. So, British Army, British Navy, they were working together. British Navy on Lake Champlain, British Army approaching Albany. Uh, the destruction of the British Navy on Lake Champlain uh, weakened the British so much that it permitted the Americans to defeat the British Army. And so, part phase one of the plan didn't work. It was a disaster. It uh, resulted in a defeat for uh, the British. Now, the second part of the plan was to extend that blockade uh, include New England in the blockade and then uh, start raiding some of these towns, especially towns on the Atlantic coast. Well, how'd that work out for the British? Well, um, the most humiliating uh, event of the War of 1812 was, for the British uh, was what happens uh, at Baltimore. The city of Baltimore is on Chesapeake Bay, and Chesapeake Bay is an inlet of the Atlantic Ocean. So the British, um, uh, and Baltimore is an important port town, and it's an important military town as well. So the British Navy sails up the Chesapeake Bay, uh, and they have every intention of capturing Baltimore um, and neutralizing the military power that Baltimore represents. Uh, the reality is, uh, that uh, they are not able to do it. Uh, the British attack at Baltimore, um, and they are repulsed. They try to uh, have a landing at Baltimore, and they are repulsed by the Americans uh, who are the American army who was stationed there. Um, one of the strongest fortifications in Baltimore was at a place called Fort McHenry. The Americans uh, uh, claimed that it was impregnable. It could not be conquered by an enemy. And uh, as it turned out, <laughs> they were right. The British attacked Fort McHenry. Um, they bombarded it. Uh, no one will ever know how many cannonballs struck Fort McHenry. But the fort, the stone walls of the fort, withstood the bombardment. Um, and the British were forced to withdraw from uh, Baltimore and Fort McHenry, which guarded Baltimore. Now, uh, that bombardment, of course, we know, at least I hope you know, that there was a poet uh, on board one of the British ships, uh, and his name was Francis Scott Key. And he observed this unsuccessful bombardment of Fort McHenry by the British. And being the poet that he was, he sat down pretty much immediately and wrote a poem. And the words to that poem became the words uh, to our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. Now, the British did have some success uh, in um, raiding uh, the East Coast cities. One of the East Coast cities was the city of Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. Washington was actually captured and burned to the ground in August of 1814 uh, by the British Army. The White House burned, the Capitol building burned. As a matter of fact, almost all government buildings burned with the exception of, uh, I think one of them was the patent office. It survived. Um, as just a little side note to history, 
Uh, the first United States census had been conducted in 1790. Um, and uh, it was stored in a building in Washington. I don't know which one it was. It doesn't matter. But what matters is that the building where that census was stored burned. And we no longer have the originals of the, the original papers of the 1790 census. Fortunately, though, uh, between 1790 when the first census was conducted and 1814 when Washington burned, uh, that census had been copied, and it, uh, and so we, we pretty much have information that was in the census. We just don't have the original. But if I were to ask you, <laughs> was the original 1790 census burned in Washington, D.C. in 1814? I would hope that you answer. Now, interesting stories around the burning of Washington, D.C., uh, of course, Madison is the president. He and his wife, Dolly, live in the White House. Um, a, a fancy uh, dinner. They had, they, remember, we talked here a while back about how uh, they, especially Dolly, loved to entertain. Well, a fancy dinner had been planned that night at the White House. And all these big shots and dignitaries had been invited. Um, uh Food was in the process of being cooked in the kitchen. Uh, the banquet table had been set with the finest linen and the finest crystal and the finest china. Uh, and uh, all was in readiness for the guests to arrive and uh, enjoy this banquet. Well, the British uh, spoiled the, store, the dinner. Uh, the British uh, attacked Washington, D.C. Uh, they uh, and the the uh, the first family, the Madisons, have to leave the city uh, in a hurry. Uh, fortunately for us, one of the things that Mrs. Madison does, there is a famous painting, of George Washington, right, that hangs in Washington right now, that was in the White House, and she was able to cut that portrait out of its frame. And hide the the, uh, the the painting under her petticoats <laughs> as they left Washington in a hurry. So that precious painting of Washington, uh, we still can enjoy it today because of the actions of uh, Dolly Madison. Well, uh, the story is told that uh, the Madisons uh, stop on a hill uh, just outside of Washington, and looking over their shoulder, they see literally capital of the United States of America in flames. Now, British officers walk into the White House. Uh, of course, they're hoping to capture the president, but they don't do that. But nevertheless, they walk into the White House and they look around and they see that the table is set for this banquet. They start sniffing and they realize that food is in the kitchen. And so they, they literally uh, take the food out of the kitchen. They set the table. They have a a banquet using the food that was intended for Madison and his guests, and then they burned the White House. Ungrateful wretches, huh? <laughs> the United States Army really doesn't make any attempt to um, protect Washington, uh, D.C. But the British begin to realize that, that part of their strategy really isn't working anyway. I mean, they have captured the city of Washington. They have burned the capital of the United States of America. But what have they really accomplished? They still don't, they haven't forced anybody to surrender yet. And so uh, that's the second part of the, uh, of the strategy really doesn't bear a lot of fruit. So what's left is the third part of the strategy. And of course, what is that? Capture the city of New Orleans. All right, let's get back to Jackson. Now, excuse me while I take a sip of my, what my, what my Madisonville grandsons refer, refers to as bubbly water. Okay. Jackson, 
Major Tennessee Militia Major General Andrew Jackson was already in the South. Um, he had stayed there. He and his army had lingered there for a little bit um, after the successful battle at Horseshoe Bend where they uh, defeat the Creek Indians. Um, he received word, oh, excuse me, itchy nose. He had received word that the British army was coming to New Orleans. And so what Jackson does, uh, uh, by the way, uh, the British army uh, was comprised of about 8,000 troops. And many of those troops were expert troops. Many of those troops had been part of the British army that had fought Napoleon in Europe during the Napoleonic Wars, before what the British thought was the end of the Napoleonic Wars. So, Jackson and his army and all of their supplies, they march overland from Alabama to New Orleans. Uh, I cannot imagine how difficult that march had to be because they did not have I-10 to march on. Uh, they had to march through swamps and marshes, and it had to be a terrible trip. But fortunately, they beat the British to New Orleans. Uh, and uh, Jackson has time, because he gets there first, uh, he has time to uh, begin to, uh, to create his uh, defensive position. And of course, uh, if, especially if you're from Louisiana, you understand that what we call the Battle of New Orleans was not really the Battle of New Orleans. It was the Battle of Chalmette. Uh, it took place near the present day town of Chalmette down in St. Bernard Parish. But nevertheless, uh, Jackson and his troops get there first. Now, the British fleet then arrives. 8,000 soldiers under a general whose name was Edward Hackenham, P-A-C-K, I'm sorry, P-A-K-E-N, no C, P-A-K-E-N-H-A-M. Hackenham uh, was in command of all the British soldiers at the Battle of New Orleans, and Hackenham was a fine soldier. He was a veteran of the Napoleonic Wars. He had done extraordinarily well in the war. He had proven himself to be a good soldier. One of the things that made Packenham a good soldier was his attention to detail. Packenham uh, always did everything he could to prepare for battle, to leave nothing undone. Uh, and as a result, when the battle began, um, he was at the he had the advantage, except in this case. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry for my runny nose. Packenham could have attacked earlier than he did, but he took extra time to prepare. Well, that helped the British. Yes, it did. But it also helped Jackson and the Americans. It gave them additional time to fortify. And so it was not until January the 8th of 1815 that Packenham feels confident that it it's okay to go ahead and attack. And the British assault the American fortifications uh, there at Chalmette. And uh, remember, 8,000 British soldiers. Of that 8,000, 2,000 were either killed or wounded that morning in less than an hour. It was, uh, it was a terrible butcher's bill that the British uh, paid that morning and included included in the uh, dead was General Packenham. Now, let me tell you a story. Let me just stop right here and tell you a story. This probably won't be on the exam. Um, many of the British soldiers were buried there at Chalmette, but not General Packenham. They wanted to take his body back to England and be buried uh, in the family plot at the family church. Uh, but it's a couple of months trip across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, and they were concerned that his body couldn't make the trip unless they did something to embalm it. And so what they did, they had they had barrels of wine 
alcohol, right? Alcohol is a good preservative. They literally put General Packenham's body in a big wooden barrel of wine. They sealed it. Uh, and the plan was to it would preserve it and they would, could get him back to England. The problem was that they lost track of which barrel his body was in. And uh, as they sailed to England, uh, at some point in the voyage, uh, they opened up a new barrel of wine, and somebody said, boy, this stuff sure tastes funny. Well, I'm not going to go into any more detail. They had opened up the barrel in which Packenham's body was preserved. What was ironic about the Battle of New Orleans? was that the battle was fought after the peace treaty ending the War of 1812 was successfully negotiated in Belgium, in a city in Belgium called Ghent, G-H-E-N-T. Now, we have talked a lot, in this, well, we've talked several times in this class, about how in those days the speed of communication was, not, was tied to the speed of transportation. And in no other circumstance can I imagine a more fitting example of that. The Treaty of Ghent was signed on Christmas Eve day, 24th of December of 1814. The Battle of New Orleans was fought on July, uh, January 8th, 1815. So two weeks later. The battle was fought. The problem, of course, is that nobody knew that the peace had broken out. The boat, the ship on, on which the Treaty of Ghent was, uh, was and was headed for America, was still out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean somewhere. And so, uh, all those lives were lost, uh, really for no reason. Now, let's play what if for a minute, though. I say it was for no reason. Let's play what if history for just a minute. What if the British had won the Battle of New Orleans? Would they, once they heard about the Treaty of Ghent, would they have said, well, the war's over, we're going to go home? That would have been the right thing to do, yes. Uh, but would the British have done the right thing? If they had won the Battle of New Orleans, they would have been in control of one of a major... Uh, of one of America's major cities and one of America's major ports. Had they chosen to, many historians say, uh, they literally could have choked, they could have shut down the Mississippi River, which would have gone a long way to destroying the American economy, and they could have forced the Americans to another negotiating table. Um, and perhaps might have forced the Americans to surrender. We'll never know because it didn't happen. But isn't it interesting to play what if? But that didn't happen. What did happen was that the United States victory at New Orleans assured that the treaty would be ratified in the United States Senate. Uh, and by the way, both sides. Remember, the British are really sick of war by now. And the Americans have a, an excuse to celebrate, so both sides are very willing to very quickly ratify the Treaty of Ghent. Now, let's talk about the Treaty of Ghent for just a moment. Uh, peace efforts to end the War of 1812 had been going on from almost the first day of the war. Remember that um, at the same time that the British government was sending the letter to the United States in 1812 that they were willing to concede a number of these issues that had caused the war. At that very same moment, at some point at the, in the Pacific, in the Atlantic Ocean, an American vessel uh, passed the British vessel, and on the American vessel was the declaration of war. So twice in that war, at the beginning of it and at the end of it, uh, the uh, the idea that uh, transportation uh, that communication can only be as fast as transportation played a really vital role in that war. But nevertheless, um, peace efforts had begun almost at the very beginning of the war. Um, but pretty.
pretty much quickly stalled out. Uh, the British were confident that they were going to win this war. Uh, they were they were just waiting for good news to appear of great victories by over by the British over the Americans uh, that would strengthen their bargaining position when it came to uh, the negotiating table. But that never that never took place. Uh, the word of the U.S. Navy victory on Lake Champlain, for example, uh, weakened the British bargaining uh, position. And honestly, um, finishing the Napoleonic Wars in Europe uh, took much of their attention. They couldn't devote all of their attention to what was happening in America. On top of all that, the British merchants were really, really anxious to resume trade with the United States. And as I've mentioned several times already, the public itself, itself was war weary. And the British finally, simply said that they asked themselves the question, is this war worth pursuing? And the answer that they arrived at was no, not. So, the Treaty of Ghent, what does the Treaty of Ghent do? Well, it ended the fighting. Uh, according to the terms of the Treaty of Ghent, all prisoners were sent back to their army. British, the British prisoners that were being held by the Americans were sent back to the British. The American prisoners that were being held by the British were sent back to the Americans. Um, the Treaty of Ghent, except for officially ending the war, sell nothing, right? <laughs> it really didn't accomplish much. And, of course, it was signed on Christmas Eve, 24th of December, 1814. But the war is over. <laughs> now, it's important for us to return to a discussion of the Federalist Party. I've already said several times that the Federalists were absolutely and totally opposed to the War of 1812. Matter of fact, many of the Federalists didn't even call it the War of 1812. They called it Mr. Madison's War. New England had made great profits uh, before the War of 1812. And New England had made great profits in the first part of the War of 1812, because remember, the British blockade did not extend to the New England ports. And so uh, the stuff, uh, uh, import items were coming into these uh, New England ports and exported items from, from America were leaving through these ports. And so many of the merchants and the shipbuilders and, and all the people in New England they were getting fat because their trade had not been interrupted by the War of 1812. Now, we know why the British did that, because they wanted to make sure that they had the sympathy of the people of New England. And we also know that in New England is where most of the Federalists lived. Now, after the fall of Napoleon, the first fall of Napoleon, the British wanted to go ahead and finish that war quick, and so they extended the blockade to New England, where it had not been before. But the people of New England, especially the Federalists who lived in New England, um, continued to oppose the war. Rather than rallying to the United States flag, um, they voted, they, they decided to have a meeting. <laughs> uh, this meeting was held in Hartford, H-A-R-T-F-O-R-D, Hartford, Connecticut. And the purpose, <coughs> and we still call this the, the Hartford Convention. The purpose of the, well, here are the purposes. It had more than one purpose. Delegates from now, remember, this is New England, so it shouldn't surprise you that the delegates came from Massachusetts, Rhode Island, 
Connecticut, Vermont, New Hampshire, right? That's pretty much New England. Um, some of the delegates literally, now I'm not exaggerating, I'm serious as I can be, some of the delegates were very much in favor of seceding from the United States. They were so unhappy with uh, with Madison and the Republicans and their policies that they were literally willing to secede from the Union. Now, it didn't happen. Uh, and to be fair, uh, those who favored secession were a distinct minority of the delegates uh, at Hartford. Most uh, were much more moderate than that. So what did the Hartford Convention decide to do? Now, remember that the Hartford Convention is meeting in Hartford, Connecticut in, the, in a time before the Battle of New Orleans. They were meeting in late, in late um, 1814. The Hartford Convention suggested that certain amendments, new amendments, be made to the United States Constitution. And all of these amendments, for one reason or another, uh, were designed to limit the power of the Republican Party, the Democratic Republicans. Think about this for just a moment. So far, how many presidents had there been? There was Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison. Washington was a Federalist. Adams was a Federalist. Uh, Washington served two terms. Adams served one. So there were three terms for Federalist presidents. Uh, Jefferson was a Republican. He served for two terms. Madison uh, was a, uh, I'm sorry, Jefferson was a Republican. Jefferson was a Republican. He served two terms. Madison was a Republican, and he was in the middle of his second term. So already, uh, we had had two Federalist presidents and two Republican presidents, um, three terms for the Federalists, four terms for the Republicans. Where were those four presidents from? Washington was from Virginia. Jefferson was from Virginia. <laughs> Madison was from Virginia. Um, so these amendments, well, let's just talk about them. Um, one of the amendments would have required a two-thirds vote to declare war or to admit new states to the Union. Uh, the way it was at that time, uh, what would it take to declare war? It was a majority vote. What's a majority vote? That's one more than one half, right? That's all it took. So, in other words, it would it would increase um, the percentage required to declare war from a little bit more than 50% to 66 and two-thirds percent. That's what two-thirds is. The same thing would apply to admitting new states. In order to admit a new state, at that time, required a simple majority. But according to what the Federalists wanted, they wanted a two-thirds majority to admit new states. Why, why make it difficult to bring new states into the Union if you were a Federalist? Well, the Federalists saw, remember the Federalists were mostly from New England, um, and New England was an important place in the country. That's where most of the industry was. That's where most of the business was. But the Federalists could see their authority. They could see their, their power. They could see their influence slipping away as new states entered the Union. At that time, there were 18 states in the Union. Five states had entered the Union since the original uh, thir 13. And those states were in the either what was called the West or in the South. Um, 
And the Federalists uh, began to realize that they were getting ready to lose their political power if, if more states from the uh, West and the South were permitted to enter the Union. So the decision was made to, to suggest that let's make it harder for new states to enter the Union. Um, the Hartford Resolves, that's what they were called, the Hartford Convention, uh, created these Hartford Resolves. Uh, one was that uh, a president be a president's term of office be set at one term, one four-year term. You could not serve more than four years. Now, think about what's going on here. Remember the Federalist, Washington from Virginia had served eight years. Jefferson from Virginia had served eight years. Madison from Virginia is in the process of serving eight years. And poor John Adams from Massachusetts, the only one of the four presidents so far who was from New England, had been defeated and served one term. So, to lessen the long-term influence of presidents, the Federalists at the Hartford Convention wanted to uh, limit presidents to one four-year term. Now, they also suggested a constitutional amendment that banned successive presidents from the same state. Well, Ray Charles can see what's happening here, right? I mean, Jefferson was from Virginia. He served eight years. Next comes Madison, who served eight years and what they don't know yet. But Monroe is going to be the next one, and he's going to serve. He's from Virginia, and he's going to serve eight years. And they're all Democratic Republicans. So you can see that as a result of these proposed constitutional amendments, in some way or another, the power of the Republicans would be limited, would be reduced. Now, the, the Hartford Convention, uh, and there are several other uh, proposed amendments, but th those are the ones that you'll see on the exam, okay? Okay. Um, they uh, they adjourn, and before, before they adjourn, they approve these proposed constitutional amendments. <clears throat> and as far as they know, at the moment, the British are going to win the War of 1812. The, the Americans, although they have done some good things, you know, the Battle on Lake Champlain and the Federalists are convinced that the British are going to be able to wear down the Americans and that the British will stay in the war as long as it takes to wear down the Americans. What the Federalists don't realize is that, is that the British are sick of war and the Federalists are not aware that the Treaty of Ghent has been negotiated and signed in Belgium, and it's on its way back to Washington, D.C., uh, where it is going to be ratified by the U.S. Senate. So, the Federalists are rather cocky. They call for another meeting in Boston for later. Um, some people are starting to say if, if, if the government, if the United States government doesn't give us what we want, we are going to get really serious about seceding from the union if our demands are not met. And so they send mess the Federalists from Hartford, send messengers to Washington, D.C. with that list of demands, with that list of proposed amendments, knowing in their heart that uh, they are going to be on the winning side. And when they get to Washington, D.C., they find that the Capitol is celebrating the good news that has just been received from Ghent and New Orleans. From Ghent, they the word has been received that, that a treaty has, has been uh, negotiated that if it's approved by the U.S. Senate, it will end the war. 
and they get the word from New Orleans uh, that the British Army has been absolutely ruined there at Chalmette. That served as a death blow for the Federalist Party. They never recovered from the uh, accusations of disloyalty and un-Americanism and narrow provincialism uh, that were stamped on it by their actions at the Harvard Hartford uh, Convention. So rather than being heroes, they're now the goats. And even though the Federalist Party will survive for a few more years, it only survives in name only. At the national level, the Federalist Party will never, ever have any appreciable power again. Now, because the Federalists mostly live in New England, the Federalists will live on longer in New England than they do anywhere else, but they even eventually die in New England. Now, what were the results of the War of 1812? Well, it, uh, it inspired patriotism and nationalism, uh, despite the fact that the Treaty of Ghent uh, didn't do much except end the war. Um, we didn't get any land from England. England didn't get any land from us. No, we didn't have to pay them any money. They didn't pay it. Right? It, the war's over. And in the eyes of many Americans and many Englishmen, that's all that really counts. The nation, uh, and, but Americans view it as a victory. Um, many Americans begin to refer to it as the second American Revolution. Um, we had uh, survived the war yet again. Let's see, 83, 17, 32 years. We had to fight the British twice in 32 years. Basically one generation. Um, um, and we had fought and come out the, the other end victorious, so many Americans thought, uh, against the greatest military and, and industrial power in the world. So it was a cause for rejoicing by many Americans. It also accomplished something else in sort of a negative way. The War of 1812 revealed weaknesses in America's infrastructure. Uh, it revealed the United States' need for uh, improving its transportation system. Uh, we had very few roads. We had very few bridges. We had very few canals. I mean, as late as 1812, uh, America's highways basically were navigable streams and lakes. Uh, but that begins to change. It launches the United States toward economic independence. Um, and it encouraged the real birth of American industry. It also, uh, our military and our Navy has been built up somewhat. Now, don't, <laughs> don't go home and tell your mom and daddy that Dr. Trailer said that we had a powerful army and a powerful Navy as a result of the War of 1812, because that is not true. But it's stronger, the Army and the Navy were stronger than they were before the beginning of the war. And I guess that that is a net improvement. In the United States, <clears throat> something that I'm not talking to you about at all, I mean, let me mention now, because, especially because our Navy was so weak, other nations of the world were able to take advantage of us, including nations of the world who weren't nearly as powerful as we were. For example, on the north coast of Africa, uh, in Tunisia and in Libya, um, there were those countries were ruled by um, tyrants. Democracy was unknown to those people. 
they were poor. Um, and they saw an opportunity to make some money off the Americans. Now, when I say that America didn't have a lot of ships, what I'm talking about is U.S. Navy vessels. What America had plenty of was merchant vessels, right? Civilian ships, uh, merchant commercial ships. The countries of North Africa, including Libya and Tunisia, depended on piracy uh, to make a living. Uh, piracy was a, a well-respected industry on the north coast of Africa. These pirates would go out, sail into the Mediterranean, and they would capture uh, the ships from other countries, including the merchant ships of the United States. Then, in order to raise revenue, they would hold the ship, they would hold the cargo, and they would hold the people uh, for ransom and would continue to hold them in the t in terrible conditions until the, uh, in this case, the United States paid ransom for the people. Now, after the War of 1812 ends, Right after the Battle of New Orleans in January of 1815, after the Treaty of Ghent is ratified by the U.S. Senate, the United States says enough is enough with these pirates. And so the U.S. Navy sent 10 ships into the Mediterranean. And they seized two Algerian ships and they sailed into the harbor at Algiers with their cannon pointing at the uh, palace of the king or whatever the heck he was. And demand that the ruler stop attacking American vessels and not only stop, but free all of the hostages uh, that have been taken. They do the same thing at other points on the coast, uh, at Tunis, Tunisia, Tripoli, Libya. Uh, and so all three of these countries, right, Algeria, Tunisia, Tripoli, uh, they all have been doing the same thing. They're all located on the north coast of Africa. They make the same pledges and the same promises. Um, and uh, the problem with the North African pirates is settled, uh, not really with gunfire, but with the threat of gunfire. And, of course, um, the, um, the landing of the U.S. Marines in North Africa has been immortalized uh, in the Marine Hymn. What is the first line of the Marine Hymn? I'm not going to sing it, <laughs> but how does it go? From the shores of Monte, from the halls of Montezuma, that's Mexico, to what? To the shores of Tripoli. And that is a direct reference to uh, the United States forcing the Libyans uh, to stop kidnapping our people and seizing our ships. Now, there is an interesting turnabout takes place uh, as the result of the War of 1812. And let me go back and remind you of the differences between the Federalist and the, Re and the Democratic Republican Party. The Federalists had always been uh, broad interpreters, broad interpreters, I'm sorry, of the Constitution. They said that the Constitution was was pretty much a just a guideline. Uh, you didn't have to go word for word by it. It was a they they interpreted it in the broadest possible way. And the Rep Democratic Republicans said, no, 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 no. The Constitution means exactly what it says and only what it says. And so the Democratic Republicans became uh, very narrow interpreters of uh, the Constitution. That is one of the reasons why Jefferson had cut back so 
drastically on the size of our army and our navy. Even though the Constitution creates the army and the navy, it says very little else about it. It doesn't say anything about how big it should be or any of that stuff. Uh, it was because of this narrow interpretation uh, of the Constitution uh, that uh, uh, Madison and Jefferson had initially opposed the Bank of the United States. And then 20 years later, why Madison uh, once again supported its destruction because it wasn't mentioned in the Constitution. And along comes the War of 1812. Oh, something else before I leave it. The, the Democratic Republicans had always opposed uh, the financing by the national government of what they referred to as internal improvements, were, which were roads and bridges and ferries and things like that. Okay, then the War of 1812 comes around. And the lack of the Bank of the United States makes it extraordinarily difficult for the United States to pursue the War of 1812. The lack of infrastructure makes it extraordinarily difficult for the United States to move men and material from point A to point B. Think about how difficult it was for Jackson, for example, to move his men and his army from Alabama to New Orleans. And as a result, the Republicans, the Democratic Republicans, start to sound like Federalists. They, many, many, not all, uh, Madison remains true, okay? But many of the Democratic Republicans begin to support the recreation of the Bank of the United States. They begin to support the idea that the national government should finance internal uh, improvements. They begin to support the idea that there should be a permanent standing army. Now, just in case you're getting ready to accuse the Democratic Republicans of being hypocrites, let's talk about the change in attitude that occurred with the Federalists. The Federalists begin to say, um, the opposite. Remember, the Federalists have always supported the Bank of the United States, uh, uh, internal improvements paid for by the national government, uh, high tariffs, all those things. The Fundamentally, what happens is the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans they swap philosophies. And by the way, that won't be the last, that was probably the first time that, that has ever happened in American political history, but it certainly would not be the last. Okay, that is 58 and a half minutes, and that's close enough to 60. All right, folks, um, I will see you uh, soon.